Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. This is ABC News Daily. Twenty years ago, Jamaa Islamia, or JI, launched its devastating bomb attacks on nightclubs in Bali, killing 202 people, including 88 Australians, and wounding hundreds of others. Today, one of Southeast Asia's most respected security analysts on the lead up to the attack and why a current lull in terrorist activity in Indonesia won't last. I'm Sydney Jones. I'm the senior advisor to the Institute for Policy Analysis of Conflict, or IPAC, in Jakarta. Sydney Jones, on this day 20 years ago, the unthinkable happened. What's your memory from that day, the 12th of October? I was at a birthday gathering in Jakarta, and when the news began to come in, uh around midnight i think we were in a state of disbelief of news a huge bomb has ripped through two bars packed with foreign tourists on the indonesian island of bali first of all we didn't think that such uh an act of terrorism could really happen in indonesia even though there had been acts of terrorism in the past but then just the scale of it and as the night went on The figures just began climbing, and we had someone in the group who had frequently gone to the Sari Club and who knew that it was packed and packed with Australians. Just after midnight, an explosion tore apart the area around the Paddy and Sari nightclubs in Kuta's packed entertainment district. Australian consular officials say the they clubs were packed with foreigners, many of Australian. whom were Australians, some of whom are still missing. One minute we were all partying and the next it just went. The whole lot was up in fire and ran for our lives, basically. Just jumped the wall and just kept on climbing and jumping and climbing and jumping. I want to get a sense from you, Sydney, about the lead up to the bombings and what was going on in Indonesia at the time. So we were three and a half, four years after the fall of Suharto. An historic day for Indonesia and the region. In the past 30 hours, 30 years of Indonesian rule from the centre by the strong man, President Suharto, has been undone. And Indonesia was in a very heady period of democratic reform, which had started almost immediately in 1999 with prisoners released, political and civil liberties restored. Every day there would be a new reform. At the same time, it was a period where some of the worst communal violence that Indonesia had ever seen had erupted in Maluku, in eastern Indonesia, and in Posto, in central Sulawesi. And there was fighting between Christians and Muslims. What that fighting did was to enable groups like Jamaa Islamiyah to take the Al-Qaeda ideology and the commitment to fight Islam's enemies and the Christian Zionist International Alliance wherever and whenever they could. It meant that for the first time, the Al-Qaeda vision of the world was translatable by these groups to a local context. So. We had had people from Jamaa Islamiyah training in Afghanistan and Mindanao, but they had never used violence until these communal conflicts erupted. And then suddenly there was this desire to avenge the deaths of Muslims. And that's what triggered J.I.'s bombing campaign. Mm, And that's ultimately, I guess, what triggered the Bali bombings. 
So this was at a time when Suharto had just fallen, a military dictator. Democracy is just really in its infancy in Indonesia. So, Sydney, what did that all mean for Indonesia's response to this horrific attack in Bali? The democratic reforms meant that when this terrorist attack occurred on such a huge scale, Indonesia did not want to take measures that it would return it to authoritarian rule. They didn't want to impose a state of emergency. They didn't want to give the military new repressive powers. They didn't want to turn their prisons into new Guantanamos where people could be locked up forever without trial. So what they did was to try and use the new democratic reforms to say to the world, Yes, this attack is horrific, but we are going to handle it in a democratic fashion. So there wasn't a witch hunt. There wasn't this roundup of people uh, and who were put in preventive detention. What there was was a commitment to work with the Australian police, do a professional investigation of the bombing, and then arrest those responsible and bring them to trial in relatively short order. And those trials were open to the public and became the way that other Indonesians learned that they had a homegrown problem, that this wasn't a conspiracy, which many people believed it was in the, in the days and weeks following the bombing. They thought it was the CIA and Mossad that had been responsible. Open trials was one of the best things that Indonesia ever did. So with the help of the AFP and others, of course, the Indonesians did successfully bring to justice the offenders in this horrific bombing. But Sydney, more attacks did follow, didn't they? So after the Bali bombs, which were the work of Indonesians who had lived in Malaysia and had open channels of communication with Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, most of those people were arrested, but there was still a group of people linked to that Malaysia group, including one Malaysian named Nurdin Top. Mm -hmm. Nurdin Top became the head of a splinter group of JI and proceeded to plan attacks in Indonesia from then on. So he was responsible for the first bombing of the Marriott Hotel in Jakarta in 2003. He was responsible for the attack on the Australian embassy the in area 2004. Around the Australian embassy is still littered with the wreckage from yesterday's bomb blast. He was responsible for the second Bali bombing in 2005. Uh, that uh, Jamaa Islamia, the regional terrorist group, which has been blamed. And for the then the there was a lull in attack in Jakarta. And then in 2009, he came back with a vengeance and uh, bombed two more luxury hotels, the Marriott again and, and the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Jakarta. And injured 55 others reveals an unexpected level of capability and sophistication by the Jamaa Islamia Splinter, Splinter Group led by the Malaysian-born extremist Nordin Muhammad Top. He was tracked down and killed shortly thereafter. And Sydney, now two decades on, has the threat gone? Has it passed altogether? No, I don't think it's passed at all. Uh, it's still with us, even though we are currently in another lull, as we were in the period between 2005 and 2009. 
the biggest threat for the last decade has come from uh, ISIS or from non-JI groups. But at the time that we were all focusing on ISIS from 2014 on and from some of these other groups, it turned out that JI was quietly rebuilding. And it was rebuilding not to undertake terrorist attacks, but to go back to its original goal, which was trying to establish an Islamic state in Indonesia, which would at the at some point involve violence, but not in the uh, in the short term. Right now, there's a major police crackdown that's been going on for the last two and a half years against J.I. So there are more than 300 members in prison. And one of the questions is whether this, in fact, might create a backlash or another splinter composed of more militant members that might want to take revenge for all these arrests. Mm, So it sounds like the possibility of future attacks, the possibility that the lull as you describe it, will end is real. Yes, I think it's real. uh, But I also think that the capacity of the Indonesian police has improved enormously. They're far more vigilant. They're better trained. Their numbers are much greater than they were in 2002. But it underscores the fact that we shouldn't be complacent. Sydney Jones is the senior advisor to the Institute of Policy Analysis of Conflict in Jakarta. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield, Sydney Peed, Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is Stephen Smiley. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again tomorrow. You can find all our episodes of the podcast on the ABC Listen app. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.